All right, let me just say the first thing is, you know, the older you get, it's not just that you have difficulty with technology that drives you up the walls, but it's also that people who are your protégés become your colleagues. And uh, what Najee Dorsey and Satiria have done here uh, far surpasses anything that you could think of and you think back and you say, oh yeah, that was the right support to give. Uh, because all of a sudden people become your colleagues and they surpass the things that you're doing and they take it, propel things forward. And that should be something that you should welcome. And certainly I'm extremely proud of the work that they do. I mean, they started off, I don't want to get into a mutual fan club session here, but, but, but they, you know, nobody even thought about some of the pinnacles of the art world until uh, they started talking about it. Uh, and when they said, wait a minute, there's Art Basel. How come we're not down there? Are you Baseling? And as a result of that effort, you go down there now and there are black people all through Art Basel. Uh, and they're mostly and black artists all through Art Basel. So I want to thank Black Art in America and the Dorseys for providing the forum for what many of us think is an important conversation. Historically, it never dawned on me years ago that uh, when I walked into the art world that I would be the only black person there that wasn't serving drinks or appetizers. I literally occupied, and in some instance continue to occupy, space in, with elites in the mainstream art world. My seat at the table is in large part due to a couple of breakthrough moments of mine as a collector, when art of mine that I collected showed up in major museum shows where I was the only black lender surrounded by super rich and elite white collectors. I was attractive as a board member for those museums then because I actually had skin in the game and I could afford the financial requirements and so was invited to join a number of major art museums, art rather, organizations and boards in Houston. I got to be involved in the networking aspects of those boards and where Art trips were taken, where conversations were had, where private dinners were held in homes. As part of a board network, I was privy to the first look and access to art work, uh, many of which those art pieces, many of which that I saw privately ended up in the hands of those people who were board members, part of that network. Some of which ended up, for instance, a piece that I got that ended up at a major museum. I donated to a major museum in Austin, Texas. This network of capability and shared artistic interest resulted in my heading a board of, art critic of an art criticism journal for five years, where that uh, journal became a, a full color, national distributed, and got a Warhol Foundation recognition. It is a world where it is easy to think, and I assume because subconsciously, I thought since I was in that insular world, that it is an equitable one, despite statistics that, re that, re that reveal just the opposite. For example, I spent some eight years at a major museum's male fundraiser, where I was the only person of color there. It's a tuxedo a dress requirement, and where the waiters, the black waiters, would enter into conversations where one, for instance, would say, I'm just waiting on them to ask John to get him a drink. And another waiter would say, no, they all know who John is. In eight years, I never thought in that insular world to ask, why is it that my friends here don't seem to have any black or brown friends, where I was the only person every year of color to be there. Uh, I never questioned the, rea the racial reality of any of this, and in an odd way, it was because I, I, I didn't see any color. I thought these are my friends, this is my social group, uh, it all seemed fair. But remember, if you're an artist whose work receives attention from this world, it means that your inclusion means that your work is regularly seen by affluent collectors, that your work, you get to get into conversation with affluent collectors, and you have the possibility of your work being shown nationally and in global markets. These opportunities make the case emphatically that breaking through the art world ceilings is clearly a smart strategy for artists. I'm not in any way arguing against that strategy. And some diversity makes sense if you are a predominantly white institution. 
You want to extend your collections and your exhibitions to include people of color. It's not about equity per se, it's about the money. Funding for mainstream museums requires that they increasingly set themselves up as bastions of diversity. And it undergirds the narrative with foundations that you know, these are universal places. Uh, and it also, though, in doing that, it fantasizes this character, it, it, it characterizes rather this fantasy is real. And it also provides the basis for funders to dismiss black assets and to dismiss funding us because this is all occurring, our story is already being told in places that they do fund. The problem is that the art world is not diverse and it's not trending toward becoming diverse. And that means for artists of color, getting into those most insular art networks is like becoming a professional athlete. The arts are just extremely difficult. And don't be gaslighted by the fame of some artists, the relatively few artists that actually get into that world, rightfully so, successfully so, uh, but they're still in, a, it does not mean that that world is diverse. In fact, they're in the same world of lack of diversity that I come from. If you've ever felt that most museums were displaying the same type of art from the same demographic of artists, you're right. A 2019 study from Williams College confirms what many of us have known and suspected for some time, that most American museums are only showing art by white men. In the survey, the researchers found that just 1.2% of the pieces in these museums were made by black artists. This is the lowest share of any race. The Mellon Foundation Association of Art Museum Directors study in 2018 found that 85% of artists represented in US museums are white and 87% are men. And that 84% of curators and 88% of museum professionals or white, with the number of black curators amounting to an abysmal 4%. Research suggests that the lack of diversity in board composition is a reason for this lack of diversity uh, and inclusion in these networks. 46% of museum boards are totally white, and that's compared with 30% of nonprofit boards which means that I'm the guy who comes and says, unfortunately, in the PR of the diversity that's supposedly going on, that actually in the museum world, in the art world, we're less diverse than the average. It makes all the more important that this is something that we recognize and we do something about. 91% of white American social networks or with other white Americans, which is the racial group that normally is in boards and the CEOs of most of these organizations. Because board members of, of PWIs tend to be older and from wealthier backgrounds, they never have the contact and the conversation with people of color that might represent artists of color. These factors both explain and perpetuate the problem of board diversity and also the difficulty of people, artists of color getting into those networks. Trust artists to reflect the world, and that's a valid proposition. But the arts are just not great for artists to change the elitist context and governance of PWIs. And while artists struggle to advance our representation in the art world, they rarely change anything on the ground. I mean, that was the basis for, remember some years ago, decades ago, when Spiral, when Romare Bearden and Norman Lewis and people came together to talk about what could we do in the civil rights movement other than represent what's going on. And that's where a Norman Lewis, who was struggling to get people to understand that abstraction meant something and had the same message for a community, he struggled. This was the guy who spent his time in the streets and at uh, civil rights organizations on the ground. And that's where black assets, especially black museums, become so important. Along with black galleries, we are the spaces where so many artists' work gets exposed to a wider public and market. And we are the conduit because we engage more than anybody with the black community to put the artist and the community together. 
Unfortunately, rarely do we have the means or connections to expand our value to artists outside of exhibiting their work. A couple of years ago, the board and staff at the Houston Museum of African American Culture decided to intentionally work at creating networks of opportunity for artists whose work we exhibit. Let me be clear again, we pledged our institution to this goal without money. HMAC is the only African American museum in the country without dedicated public funds as a public good. So when the California African American Museum begins this year with $3 million, or the Baltimore Museum begins this African American Museum begins this year with $2 million, or the Philadelphia Museum, African American Museum, shout out as a new American treasure, starts this year out with $800,000. In HMAC, we start off with what we can sell and what we can get. Uh, that's it. I always remind people when they think, oh, that's so horrible, I always remind people, we are in Texas. Think about that. <laughs> think about that, you know. So creating these networks of opportunity is not necessarily about money. It is about leveraging every contact in the black and white world your institutions and your board have, and it requires connecting to black neighborhoods where you can create value and service. Years ago, HMAC decided that museums focused too much on getting the public to visit on the museum's terms and not enough on creating a cultural community based in neighborhoods where our visitors reside. Our added emphasis on building cultural capital in neighborhoods allows us to escape the current paradigm that our political and philanthropic elites are so wedded to. That is the strategy of remediation of wrongs rather than individual and community empowerment. Cultural capital is not created by community Christmas tree lightings or Thanksgiving free meals, nor is it created by painted utility sites without message that erroneously suggest an integration of artists and community. There is no community empowerment in these actions. To build cultural capital in low-income and African-American neighborhoods, we must provide those na these neighborhoods with cultural assets. That's why it's nice that black art in America exists as it does. Yes, yes. As a result, HMAC has become a museum in a building and in the community. We now connect with public through active value-aligned partnerships in Houston's African-American neighborhoods with the goal of engaging these communities in cultural conversations and thereby expand the influence of the museum and artists as a vehicle of empowerment beyond destination visits, which is the mainstay of museums. Of course, every museum should work to move artist shows to other venues. But our board and staff decided a few years ago that the connections need to go further than that. When we get artists in the neighborhoods, as we say, we don't rep the community and our culture, we are the community and our culture. PWIs shun our neighborhoods. Just don't go there. That's just a fact, just don't go there. Emphasizing to their funders how much of a diverse audience that they can bring to where they are. The following are a few examples of how HMAC being intentional about defining the museum as a creator and the basis of an expansive artist network can happen despite severe underfunding. And how important it is to both expand their opportun artist opportunities and also find a way to connect artists to their neighborhoods. And when you stop and think about it, if PWIs are not coming into our neighborhoods, even as they show artists, they're not integrating them into our neighborhood. They just become a place where we, they rep the culture, but they don't become a part of the culture. So let me talk about these examples, what we've done with this intentionality. During the pandemic, the museum mounted a mask up campaign with artist design signage that was placed on buildings in low income areas all over the city. That was featured around the city in a mobile funeral home hearse. It's the pandemic. Uh, and that was uh, introduced at a program uh, that was at a rally, a downtown rally by the mayor of Houston. Half of those signs remained up for two years and one of them remained up right across the street forever from one of the most popular black restaurants in the city. 
After a successful public art project in two black neighborhoods, the museum acted as the mediator in bringing together an artist with his first gallery. And that show, his first show, turned out to be a sellout. We filmed his public art for us and are in the final edits of a documentary, short, that will be entered in the film festivals. We have additionally planned uh, publishing a book by the artist that will be sold in our museum store. PNC is the sponsoring company and has naming rights in the VIP lounge at the Toyota, Toyota Center, which is the arena for the Houston Rockets in Houston. The PNC lounge is directly off the court and VIPs have access to it, to it during Rockets games and at concerts. Last year, the Rockets and PNC decided they wanted to refresh the lounge and they wanted to refurbish it, so they did a paint job, spruced it up and said they wanted to uh, get some artists to paint a mural of it. They reached out to our vendor who then reached out to us. After one of our vendors met with the stakeholders, he was asked to recommend an artist and came to us for suggestions. While providing a short list of artists, he also recommended and emphasized that an artist for who we acted as fiscal sponsor should be the artist chosen for the $20,000 commission. This commission serves as a tremendous platform for the artist, and he did receive the commission, uh, because they've set aside a part of the lounge for him to talk about his work and for him to put materials. The lounge opens in October, and at the opening of the Rockets schedule, and the artist uh, and his family will be introduced. One of HMAX vendors came to us after a client of his, a major hospital in a different city outside of Houston, reached out requesting a list of artists that could be commissioned to paint its president's portrait. After providing a list of five artists, our vendor, about to be a board member, uh, both recommended and emphasized that the artist whose work appeared in our Burt Line Gallery for Emerging Artists uh, was a clear choice. While the vendor was aware of the artist's work from HMAC, uh, he had the opportunity to meet with the artist when the artist was doing a live painting at the museum. And they talked, and at that, in that conversation, the vendor got to know that the artist had ties to the city where the hospital was. And not only had ties to it, had recollections of growing up and doing things with it. The vendor shared those comments with the stakeholders at the hospital, and they, in fact, then decided to choose the artist that we had uh, recommended. We engaged yet another artist who had an extremely successful exhibit at our Burt Lawn Gallery for Emerging Artists through acting as a mediator for the artist and a Chicago gallery, where the artists had their first show for the first time outside of Texas and gained a whole new audience. Subsequent to that gallery showing, we provided her with recommendations for graduate art school, and when she was accepted, we went into that community and found people that would help them find an apartment and her husband find a job. We remained the fiscal sponsor for a black dance company and acted as the principal sponsor for its 15th anniversary performance, as well as being the fiscal sponsor for an artist who created our first message murals in three different black neighborhoods, including one inside a black high school. And the, the words in that mural in that high school that students get to see every day are, the world needs what you have to give. They wake up with that every day. Another artist had an exhibition at HMAC that was judged one of the top two in the state of Texas and was featured on NPR. That exhibition traveled to two other sites in Texas. And we, we then, we now are working with that artist who will start a residence with, at an inner city high school in October, next month. During the museum's art trip to Richmond to see the Dirty South at its initial venue at the Virginia Museum of Fine Art, and to Washington, D.C. to visit the National Gallery. Four artists and their spouses accompanied us with free rooms and were a part of the museum finance lunches and dinners. Finally, and something that we are extremely proud of, and I, I see it here that's happening here, uh, we, work with the artists, we work with the artists who show at the museum and get prints from them. And we sell those prints, we get consignment from them, and we sell those prints at the museum store. Those, 
those prints start at $25 to $85 and, um, and go up to $1,500 and we do Cezzle pay. Uh, but in that way, we have, and we have gotten the work of black artists in thousands of homes uh, throughout Houston. And that way, now you're talking about in those homes, in our community, that cultural capital, that empowerment takes place when every kid that's in those homes looks at that art, recognizes an artist, know that's an artist that's been shown in a museum, the importance of that, and thinks to themselves, some of them who think that, well, I could be an artist like that too. Um, so there are more than these nine examples of what we do, but it shows the intentionality that the museum, any museum can have even without having the proper funding. A couple of highlights come to mind uh, as for other museums to expand into a basis for creating networks uh, for black artists. First, we strongly, strongly suggest consignment of artist work uh, and the reselling. I think that there's no, I mean, for everything we, we do, we are most proud of the impact that we have of getting art into homes in our community. That, so whatever you do, and that's past an exhibition, it's what institutions can do, black museums, black galleries can do for artists uh, and for community. Secondly, we strongly endorse a museum trip that includes artists along with museum patrons. Um, with some subsidy. That doesn't mean that you have to have a trip that requires you to fly somewhere. You can have a, a we can take a trip to Athens, uh, Georgia. But the point is that we engage artists past that exhibition into a conversation with museum patrons, that is with people who can pay for that trip and get that dialogue going. It's more than what that, and, and, and enhance that network. Third, we strongly endorse public art projects. I was, at the time that I was asked to head HMAC, well, while I was heading HMAC, I was also the vice president of the board of uh, the city's arts agency. And uh, it was strongly recommended that I, I become chairman of that arts agency. I had been the vice chairman I've been head of finance, I've been treasurer, I've been head of strategic planning. Uh, but in all the time that I served there, I constantly asked that we provide public art in low-income neighborhoods. And I never got it until I stayed and turned that down and stayed at HMAC. Uh, fourth, we strongly suggest surveying your board and vendor base to identify opportunities for artists that the museum can mediate. You never know until you have, until we have this discussion, hey, what more can we do? Who are you connected to? Najee Dorsey talked about it at the very beginning. Relationships are imperative. And every board, and not just board members, but vendors who work with us, we found, have relationships that somehow we can pass on and make valuable to artists. Just have to think about it and find a way. Fifth, we strongly recommend a workshop on this topic being held at the next annual meeting of the Association of African American Museums. Finally, it seems a bit unfair, if I might use the word, that foundations fund the Black Trustee Alliance, and it only includes black trustees at PWIs. Funding a Black Trustee Alliance that includes trustees from black museums and topics like this one would allow the kind of networking where the intent in both cases is the elevation and expansion of opportunity for black artists. All right, thank you. I'm sure we, have, I'm sure we got some questions for John. When I say that we're very intentional, you have to be extremely intentional about it. But coming from that world, there's one thing that we do know. And that's that. It's why I say, you know, we have a museum in Houston that says trust artists. But trust artists to do what? And on their board, they have artists. But you're on a board with people um, whose social networks never include you. It's very difficult. It speaks to the segregation in our society. I come from a city that loves to talk about Houston's the most diverse city in the country. Uh, and uh, we have entertainers and everybody mimicking that message. It is demographically, 
but it is the fourth most economically segregated city in the country. So part of the point comes back to answer your question. The difficulty, the challenge comes in how do we get these income levels where we don't have any money and there are more people on the other side that do have money. How do we get them into the same room with the same level of respect? I mean, it's sort of like, you know, the importance of being in that mainstream network is so important that when we have a black trustee alliance, the focus is on how can we get the boards, if you're on a board and you're black on a mainstream board, how can you influence them? That's our focus. And what's always left behind are our neighborhoods uh, where we don't have, we don't, that doesn't necessarily build cultural capital, especially when so few people go to those museums from our communities. So it's a very difficult question and I think it comes down to economics. Uh, and also just honesty. Honesty means that, you know, if I'm talking to, for instance, a, 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 a director of a, a museum in Houston that uh, says that they are, you know, they hire black people, they've got uh, all of these, uh, uh, these uh, black uh, artists coming through there at all times, they can do all these things, and wants to suggest that somehow we're, we should be together, we're the same. Well, the reality is we're not the same. First of all, you've got a $10 million budget endowment, and we don't have one at all. Secondly, you know, your board is primarily white, and, the, and, and to get board members, coming back to your question, to get board members, you have to get artists. And even if you say trust artists, we're not on the same page for governing how resources are used. If you're there without the money, then you're influencing people, you're not being determinative. There are ways to do that. I will tell you, I was on a board where I started a, and we had six black board members. We really increased it. And what we did was we had, uh, we had a fundraiser and it was called Champagne and Ribs. And uh, we call that, and you know, if you're honest about who you are, and that's the first thing. Stop pretending that we're something that we're not. If you're honest about who you are, I just said, we need a rent party. And this was our rent party. <laughs> and, and in that way, every individual board member there on that museum board contributed the same amount. And in that way, that voice was the same voice. When you don't contribute the same amount, you somehow feel, even though people will tell you, oh, it doesn't work doesn't matter. When you don't contribute the same amount, you feel like you have less of a voice, you're more hesitant, and then we don't have the conversation we need to have. And then it becomes less accessible or attractive to get other people who do have money, who are black, to enter into that conversation. But basically the first thing to do is to have the people who are there, who are there, actually participate in a conversation who they think with people who they think are not their economic equals. Well, I think if you, if you notice anything, without money, we've already established networks for artists. And so I want to first make that point. I'm going to come back to what money will do. And money will, I, well, I'll answer that part first. I always tell people, you know, say, what do you need? We need more money and more people. Uh, we can do what we're doing now, we can do 10 times, 11 times what we're doing now. We can have satellite museums if we have money. We could be in our community with PWIs are not in them. And remember, PWIs, I mean, I want to get back to this community aspect of this because PWIs don't get money from being in our communities. They get money by saying that they represent us where they live and then we come to where they are. The cultural capital that exists when we create cultural assets in our communities, where if you want to, we're, struck, we're fighting now with about an unused school building in the community that the community wants, that we want as a satellite, the cultural capital that exists when people say they want to see something that the museum has to offer and they have to go to the hood to see it. For the people there, it's tremendous. We have a public art project now that... Uh, from a fantastic artist that we're doing the documentary on that involves string. It's in a median, and we chose him because we said, uh, look, we want you to do this, 
but we don't ask permission. So we ain't asking about permits. We're just going to do it. And he said, I do that already. So that was good. But we have string, it's string. And I remember when it first went up, this is one of the two, it first went up and um, I drove by at night and I called my operating officer and I said, Davinia, this is really nice, but I hope it's there in the morning. Because you know, you're buying into that constant PR that we don't appreciate our stuff. In fact, it's the direct opposite. That thing's been up there now untouched with people. It's a web that people interact with all of the time and speak to how proud they are that it's in their community, that they can interact with public art that's interactive, not a piece, not something to it, that is interactive for them. Um, so money, money just allows us to do a lot more of that. It allows us to be in communities because remember, what money really does to us, if we really want to say, I mean, look, our chief curator is one of the top in the field. He gets us on the cover of Art in America. And, and that's good for the kind of representation for the competition we get as a museum in the museum district with our competitors who show top level art. We do top two. We do the same kind of stuff. But we're also, we're always tasked with something that seems to get away from elites. And remember, most museums are built for elites. And that's the fact that we don't, we're challenged as an African-American museum. And Najee said we're a community space. Just an aside, when I took the job, I said, coming from my background, what you heard, I said, we will not be a community organization. We will be a professional museum. And, and that changed, that, that changed radically. But you know, with, with the money, we can put the focus on our communities. So what we're missing, while we have a chief curator that gives us, that allows us to compete with however good it gets at the Museum of Fine Arts or the Manil or anywhere else, whether it's acknowledged or not, and we'll acknowledge it ourselves, we, can, we do still need to be in those communities. And we do not empower anything until we're in those communities. Go look at wherever you are in most communities around the country, and certainly in Houston, we don't own any property in our communities. I mean, I was the big bold guy who said, we're putting up message murals, and that's we're going to be in the community. And we put up one on a funeral home, big huge mural that says that people see with a little black boy and a little black girl that said these lives matter. And we put another one up in the south side of the city uh, with these feet over skyscrapers that said be at your best. Uh, and we put up one in the fifth, in the fifth ward that another low income area uh, that says we love the fifth ward. And then we have the mural in the high school. But after that, there's no, there's no, there's no room. So the money for us would be to either build, do what these folks, Satiri and Naji have done, to build in those communities, or to fight for the spaces that we're fighting for now. And remember, even that unused school building, which is right dead in the community, where the school superintendent at Houston won't even respond to our emails. We have to fight for it. Uh, but money would allow us to build those assets. Well, this was lovely. I know you're going to cut me off. I just enjoyed you. Thank you.